we technically um, completed chapter 35 and 36 last week, but we're going to spend the first few minutes in uh, just looking at the end of 35 and then make one point about Esau's descendant in, descendants in chapter 36. But last week we saw that Jacob, who is the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, travels from Shechem to Bethel, and he, and he you know, takes all the idols out of his family before he goes to Bethel to re really re repent and to renew his dedication to God and God's promises to him. And then he goes to Bethlehem, where Rachel dies, giving birth to Benjamin, and then to Hebron to bury his father. And Esau comes from, probably from Edom, comes up, and the two brothers bury their father Isaac, who has now passed. And there would have been some kind of inheritance. Uh, you know, Jacob was the one, even though Jacob was second born, he became the firstborn by right because Esau sold his birthright. So there had been everything that was Isaac's would have been turned over to the two sons based on the birthright issues that they would have worked out. And, uh, and so then this week, we're going to see that, that Jacob again has his favorite son, Joseph. And Joseph is going to do some things that infuriate his brothers, and they hate him. They want to kill him. And uh, it turns out they end up selling him into slavery. And we're also going to see that one of the dreams that Joseph has that he shares with his brother and even with his dad, uh, those dreams are actually something that unlocks a prophecy of the New Testament that without this section of Scripture today, we can't understand. You know, the book of Revelation is a hard book to understand. And if you just read Revelation chapter 12 without knowing the dreams of, Jake, of Joseph here in this section of Scripture, you know, people can have a million different ways of interpreting uh, the section of Scripture, the prophetic Scripture. But with this story of Joseph, then we have a perfect key to unlock it, and we see that it pertains to prophecies yet future to us. And so we're going we're gonna to take a little bit of a rabbit trail to go look at that, and, and the reason why I want to do that is because, as I've emphasized, why do we study the Bible? It's a miraculous book. It's a, it's a congruent, cohesive uh, look at history that shows us that God, in his prophetic word, says and does things, does things through history. You know, Joseph has this dream. It gets recorded 4,000 years ago. And yet that dream is an interpretation of the book of Revelation that is going to deal with what's going to happen in the tribulation period. And, and there is no other book like this. You could, man couldn't have put this together. Moses couldn't have put it together. It's something that makes us realize that we're studying the truth. And I hope it strengthens everybody in that. And also the other reason why we study is you look at this section and say, oh, well, let me just say, how many of you have ever been wronged by somebody? <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I, I was only expecting people that are under two years old to be not raising their hand there. I mean, we, we've, all, we've all been wronged, and, and our fleshly nature is to become what? Bitter, hateful, get back, or get ahead, you know? I don't, I'm not going to get even. I'm going to get ahead. It's kind of the worldly attitude. And see, God has it. God doesn't want us to have a worldly attitude. He wants to have the attitude that we as Christians under his care, we know that all things work out together for those that love God and are called according to his purpose, right? We know that to be true. And so we're going to see here that God allows horrible things to happen to his people throughout history, Joseph just being one. You know, did anything happen bad to Jesus? Of course. And yet it was all working out together for good. He was, he was allowing the, the mocking, the spitting, the rejection, and everything to make us realize there's people that hate our Jesus, and they mock him, and yet he sits there, God forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, he could have destroyed the world, but he, was, he didn't come to condemn the, the, the world, but that the world through him could be saved. And so we, too, we, might, we can accept hardships in life, we can accept being done wrong, knowing that somehow the Lord is going to work it out to a greater good if we just have love and compassion for him. And just trust him because he's in charge of our life. And we know that just this life is over that quick. And when we realize this quick, you can endure anything. 
and, and then we're going to have eternal life in heaven. So it's, this section of Scripture, Joseph does an incredible job of being horribly mistreated for years and years and years. And yet he keeps trusting God, and God works a miracle that saves the entire Jewish race as a result because he just trusted in God uh, despite this. And even when his brothers you know, realize, whoa, <laughs> look at what happened when we read the rest of the story, he goes, that's all right. What you meant for evil, God has turned to good. And in our lives, all the evil turns to good. Now let's look at the early church. Was the early church persecuted and hated by Romans? You know, tortured. I mean, racked, you know, tied up to a rack. And then they pull them apart and torture them. Uh, how could that be good? What about the families that were affected and everything else? Well, because in the early church, people, it was ingrained in everybody then. It was ingrained through the history of the church that they must really believe this Jesus is alive and touch their life and came inside of them if they're willing to endure all of this for the name of Jesus. Is that a good thing? Is it a good thing that the gospel spread through the persecution of the Roman uh, persecution against the church? Of course it is. <laughs> you know, and, and what God is interested in, and he goes, when he says all things work out together for good for God, it's like, and the good is that through the crucible of persecution and being done wrong, you love, it spreads the gospel. And that's a good thing. Because his mission is for everybody that isn't, that isn't spiritually brain dead and so full of their pride they can't come to Jesus. It's a good thing if Persecution and other things bring people to their knees in repentance. You know, people watching, persecuting Christians and then seeing their love. If it brings them to humility and they get saved, that's a good thing. And that's, uh, that can happen in your life. You could be persecuted by family, by friends, by no co-workers, neighbors, etc., etc. And if, you, if you're like Joseph, you'll have a witness to them. If you're like the world and uh, you fight back... <laughs> then you'll have lost your witness. So that's, that's why this four, almost 4,000-year-old history here is applicable to our life today, which is why we study the Bible. So let's, uh, Genesis 35, 27. Then Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kirjus the Arba, which is Hebron, city in Israel to this day, southern Israel, where Abraham and Isaac had dwelt, now, the days of Isaac were 180 years old. Again, as we've emphasized previously, people were still living a long time, longer than today, because the effects of the flood that had changed the environment uh, had not completely uh, reached equilibrium yet to reduce man's uh, years of age. So Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. And you can, if you want to, you can search on the tomb of the patriarchs. You can see the building that's there in Israel today in Hebron. Uh, people have gone there. You can go visit it. And this is the place where 4,000 years ago, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Leah, uh, uh, were buried in, uh, not Rachel, but uh, Rebecca. And so there was, you know, burial there of those at Hebron. Then chapter 36, which I said it's just a bunch of Edomites that are coming out of Esau. I want to emphasize one of them. Chapter 36, verse 1. Now this is the genealogy of Esau, who is Edom. So Jacob's brother Esau, who hated his birthright, didn't, you know, sold his birthright to Jacob because he, he hated his birthright, didn't care about spiritual things. Jacob did. This Esau became known as the Edomites. He's the father of the Edomites. When you read the Bible, the Old Testament, and every time you see Edom, you see they are descendants of Esau. Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan. He, he married two Canaanite floozies that, again, it upset his parents because they didn't want his, their son to marry immoral Canaanite women, but he did because he didn't care about the things of God. Verse 3 and Basmeth, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebuchadnezzar. So he also married an Ishmaelite, meaning not a Canaanite. He married an Ishmaelite, meaning somebody who was descended from Ishmael, a daughter of Ishmael. Now go to verse 12. Now Timnah 
was the concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son. And he was Esau's son through the Ishmaelite wife. And she bore Amalek to Eliphaz. So that's all I want to emphasize out of chapter 36, is when you read the Old Testament, you see that the arch enemy of Israel, one of the arch enemies of Israel, are the Amalekites. And Amalek, who is the father of the Amalekites, was a descendant of Esau. So in a sense, he's an Edomite. You know, the, Alma, the Amalekites were, just, were Edomites, and they hated the nation of Israel. And you can read the book of Esther to see an example where Haman, who conspired to completely eliminate the Jewish people on earth when the Persians ruled, Haman was an Amalekite. So, and he, he can trace his lineage all the way back to Esau. So with that, let's go to chapter 37 and verse 1. It says, now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan, because Hebron is in Canaan. It's about 18 miles south of Jerusalem. And verse 2, this is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, which that establishes there about 10 years in Shechem, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, it says wives, they were actually his concubines because Bilhah and Zilpah, Zilpah were the maid servants of his wives, Leah and Rachel, and they each had two sons. Bilhah had Dan and Naphtali, Naphtali, and Zilpah had Gad and Asher. So those are four of the 12 tribes of Israel. And Leah gave birth to six sons. So there's six sons plus the four sons of the two maidservants, so that's ten, and the last two are Joseph and Benjamin, who were the sons of Rachel. So he's with the sons of the concubines, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. So what, is, what does it really say? If we were to write it today, we'd say Joseph snitched. <laughs> Joseph snitched on his brothers. And and apparently, there must have been a tribal segregation. Leah's sons, which Leah, the, the eldest, was Reuben, and so they're off by themselves. We don't want to have anything to do with you concubine sons because you concubine sons are not like us, the sons of Leah. And then Joseph's in there with the concubines because we're going to tell that the brothers already hate Joseph and because their father loves Joseph. And so he just... He is a God-fearing man. We're going to find one thing out about Joseph. He loves God. He has integrity like pretty much nobody else in the Old Testament. He has a complete devotion, complete dependence, and everything about God. And he's with these brothers that we know the Jewish brothers are corrupt. We, we see that as we go through the text of Genesis and on the rest of the way in the Old Testament. And so he's with his his four of his brothers, and he goes, well, you guys are sinning against God. You're sinning against God. You're sinning against our dad, and I'm going to go tell dad. Now, how do we deal with that? <laughs> Again, raising children, right? Does a child ever come to us and say, mommy, mommy, daddy, daddy, <laughs> you know, my brother, my sister did this and that. And I, I think there's one thing that we as Christians should be careful to, to not complain about the snitching aspect of it, Right? Because isn't it good that sin gets a light put on it? Isn't it a good thing within the family that the parents, the authority, know that something is happening within the family? And it should be to the point where, why do we want that? Well, because we want all of our children to realize you're not going to get away with anything. And why is it a good thing for the children to realize they're not going to get away with anything? Because they're not going to get any away with anything of God. See, we could as parents say, look, don't get upset about your brother or your sibling snitching on you because somebody else has already knows what's going on higher than me. God knows what you're doing. God knows you're sneaking out at night. God knows you're, you're starting to smoke when we told you not to smoke. God knows you're doing drugs when we told you not to drug. God knows when you're, you're, you're drinking, you're doing this, you're doing this. And so it's brought to my attention. I'm telling you, someday you're going to answer to God and he knows everything. And don't be upset with that. In fact, the Bible says your sins will find you out. 
that God will expose sin. And it, and it even says in the Scripture, in Ephesians, it says that, that it's shameful to mention some of these things that people do, and it should be exposed. We should expose these things. But they, like everybody else that's in the world, in the flesh, they hate being snitched on, and they hate him for this. And Joseph bad, brought a bad report to them of his father. So we have in the Bible, right down here, first whistleblower. <laughs> And uh, so they, he did, wasn't able to keep his identity secret, and so he gets hated. Uh, and verse 3, now, Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. And, I mean, it says here in the Scripture, because he was the son of his old age. He was also the first son of the wife that he really wanted to marry in the beginning before he got to see and we can tell also, Jacob also had a heart for God. And it's not unlikely that he had a heart for Joseph because he saw Joseph loving God. Now, is it true that we as parents, what's the greatest joy of a Christian, God-fearing parent is that they would watch their children grow up in the love of God. And we love our children all the same, except if I have a child that's rebelling against God and therefore rebelling against me as a parent, then I'm going to have, a, I'm, they're not going to experience the same kind of love <laughs> because it's going to be hard love. People go, oh, you know, God doesn't love me. What has he ever done for me? As they're sitting in jail because they've been rebelling against God and man and, and they expect something from God. So we should instill in our children, I love you all the same, but if you're going to fight God and therefore fight me, we're not going to get along. You're not going to feel like it's a super wonderful relationship because God God says in his word, he disciplines those he loves. And, and if it wasn't for my love for you, I wouldn't discipline you. And so don't give me this, you love, you love goody two-shoes brother or sister that still loves Jesus and wants to, wants to uh, serve God more. I, I love him. I just don't have to discipline him or her. And to let the children know that. But see, in Jacob's family, they like the world. As soon as they see somebody being favored, their pride, their arrogance, their rebellion against God turns into bitterness and hatred. And see, it should not be in our life. In fact, the Scriptures, <laughs> it says, why should we, everything that we've received, we received as a gift from God. Why should, we, why should we worry about what somebody else gets or whatever gift? See, the Christian attitude is, I don't care if they get blessed more than me. I'm blessed by God because He saved me and I'm going to go be with him. I'm doing what God has called me to do. They can do what God is calling them to do. See, this whole section of Scripture shows us how not to be and how to be, to maintain really good, to, to maintain our mental health as God would want us to have because he created us. If we're in obedience to him and the attitudes we have, we can enjoy life even if life is not fair. Life is not fair. <laughs> in fact, there were times when the boys were growing up, and they say, that's not fair. I know, life's not fair. It's okay, yeah, I'll admit it. It's not, these things are, you know, we're not here for life being fair. It's not fair. If it was fair, Jesus would not have gone to the cross for us because he, deserved, of all people that have ever lived on earth, didn't deserve to die. And he took the unfairness upon himself for the sake of saving us. And aren't we glad that he did? And we too can be treated unfair. And he had, uh, he's a favorite firstborn, had the coat of many colors. The tunic of many colors is what, in those days and in the culture, it was like, he's like my firstborn. And he's, he's many years younger, he's seven years younger than the oldest. And, and so, the, what do you mean, you're the one? I'm older than you. I was, you know, my mom was the, was the one that was the first wife that he married. And I'm a descendant, I should get all, the, and they... Their arrogance, their pride, their thinking of worldly has created this hatred that doesn't work well for them. They should have said, yeah, it makes sense. Our dad would, would favor you. You never give him a hard time. You never backtalk him. You never cuss at him. You never sneak around and do evil stuff. You just want to be daddy's boy. Yeah, we want to be. Do we want to be daddy's boy? We want to be God the Father's boy. Just be the one that just serves him loves him. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. 
Um, nothing Joseph could do about it. And now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, he gave them the dream, which is why they hated him, and explains what the dream is now in verse 6. Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and indeed your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. Now, for those that don't know what, haven't sung the song, bringing in the sheaf. <laughs> you know, when people harvested back in those days, they'd go through the standing wheat grains or whatever grain they were, they were harvesting, and they would grab a handful and they would sickle at the bottom, and then they would just keep on sickling, and then there would be people bringing these hand bundles and then building, you know, putting them into big bundles and tying something around it, their kind of rope back in those days, and then they would stand them up so that when you saw the harvesters done, you would see throughout the field, you would see all these standing sheaves. And then they would collect those sheaves onto a cart, take it to the threshing floor and thresh out the grain, and so he's saying, basically, at the harvest, you know, harvesting going on, my sheaf, the sheaf that I put together, was surrounded by you guys, and you guys are all bowing down to my sheaf. So here's a little punk kid <laughs> that they already hate because he's, he's daddy's boy that snitches on him. And then he goes, you know what? I had a dream. You guys bow down and worship me. And, and they just hate him for it. And... I've read commentators that said that, you know, Joseph was foolish to share this with his brothers and stuff, but no, this isn't foolish. This is God-ordained. This is incredible because this is, th think about this. What did Jesus come to do? Jesus came to say, unless you believe in me, you'll die in your sins. So he came to his Jewish brothers and he said, unless you bow to me, then you aren't even bowing to the Father. You've got to bow to me or you'll die in your sins. And they go, who are you? Who are you to say, tell me what to do? We want to kill you. Did kill him. As compared to Joseph, where they only planned to kill him, but God in his, in his, you know, his miraculous ways of creating this story has, has Jacob think he's dead. Father thinks his son has died, but actually he was just sold into slavery in Egypt, and he comes back to him later. How interesting is that? The father thinks he's dead. The scribes and Pharisees thought he was, Jesus was dead for a while, but is he coming back? You know, he came back alive, but he's coming back again. And see, when, when Joseph comes back alive to his father Jacob years later, many years later, he just rejoices, oh, I thought you were dead, but you're alive. And even his brothers bowed down to him, and they thanked Joseph for keeping them alive, for giving them life. And so what does that tell us? That when Jesus comes back, his brothers who crucified him and actually killed him and see that he's alive and coming to rescue them and to give them life are going to, according to Zechariah, they will look on him whom they pierced, who they killed, and weep and wail. Now, again, the Bible is just incredibly miraculous. I hope I made that clear enough that you realize how miraculous this book is. This account of Joseph is pointing historically 4,000 years ago to us, 2,000 years before Jesus, the book was pointing to another situation, pointing to what Jesus was going to do on our behalf. And so he's not being stupid. He's not being, he's just doing what God wants him to do for the sake of uh, bringing this type of Jesus to the biblical record. Uh, verse 8, and his brother said to him, shall you reign over us or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. So what was it that really kept them from believing their brother? What, what was the, what was, you know, everything is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Which of those was it? Pride of life. In fact, it's pride. Truly, it is pride that keeps man, every man, woman, from believing in Jesus. Who are you to rule over me? I've got my own life to live. I've got my own things to do. I know the people, you Christians, you tell me that if I just bow my knee to Jesus that I can be forgiven of sin, but he's going to change me and I'm going to want to do what he wants me to do. I have to say I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he now rules over me and I don't want to do that. And that's what keeps people from receiving Jesus, so instead they hate Jesus, just like 
the brothers of Joseph. And what's really tragic is his dream was the truth. They couldn't humble themselves enough to accept and receive the truth. And the truth is the same with Jesus. Jesus says, if you don't believe in me, you will die in your sins and suffer eternity in hell. It's the truth, and yet people don't care. And they reject Jesus. And in fact, that verse, it's not in your notes, but John 8, 23, and he said to them, you are from, he was telling the scribes and Pharisees, you are from beneath, you're from hell. Your attitude is cooked in hell. I am from above, I'm from heaven. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. John 8, 23, 24. And they hated him for it. How are you to tell us that we have to believe in you to be saved? Well, because it's the truth. It's the truth then, it's the truth today. Uh, Verse 9, then he dreams still another dream. At a different time and place, we can tell, because his dad's involved this time. And he told it to his brothers, and apparently all the brothers, except for Benjamin, who's just still a baby. Look, I have dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother, now dead, and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now that's an important part. The father said, huh, what if this in my godly, God-fearing son, what if this dream is from God? You know, it, it cuts my pride. Am I going to bow down to you? And your brothers bow down to you? But what if it's true? And now, you know, think about, well, oh, we'll catch in a parallel to that here in a bit. But what do we understand from this? Jacob knew that the, this dream, the sun and the moon being added, is that's symbolic of Jacob and the wives that gave birth to the 12 sons of Israel. And so that's what the sun and the moon is. And the 11 stars, what are they? They're the 11 sons of Jacob. That's the biblical interpretation of what this means. So let's turn to Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. As I said earlier, without this section of Scripture, we would not be able to unlock the meaning of Revelation 12 with the authority of the Scriptures to do so. Now today, there's... Washingtonians and people all over the country who are just in anxiousness and anxiety over who's going to win the Seahawks-Packers game. <laughs> and, but John Pricer, he, yesterday he prophesied the Seahawks are going to lose, so we'll see. But he doesn't, have, he doesn't have the same track record the Bible does, right? And so when God gives prophecy, and we're going to unlock it through this section in 3,900-year-old section of scripture, um, see, we can just have assurance. If you knew for assurance what was going to happen in the game today, all anxiety is removed, everything else. In fact, I hate to call it football because really the soccer people that I know, they go, why do you guys call it football? We have football, it's soccer, which they really should be right because they actually use their foot to play the game, you know, so it's football. (laughs) And hardly anybody uses their foot except the kickers. In, in our football, but if, if we knew what was going to happen, you decide, I'm not worried about the outcome, right? I just know what's going to happen. And I, I don't care win or lose, I don't care. But see, we know from Scripture who wins in the end. God wins in the end. And if you knew that a team is going to win, and it looks so bad in the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, are you concerned at all? And you consider it's a blowout. It's impossible for my team to win. But if you know by a prophetic utterance that you have 100% assurance is true, you would not be bothered. You'd just be sitting there going, I know how it ends. We know that God wins. We know that Jews stay around till the end of time. We know that there's an antichrist that's going to be coming onto the scene, but he, and he is going to try and wipe out the Jews and wipe out all the people that God loves. But we know from chapter 12 of Revelation that that is not going to happen. And we know that that interpretation can be had because of what we're reading today, which is why... We're going to spend a little bit of time here, even though it's a little bit off topic. 
So Revelation 12, 1, it says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven. This is John the Apostle seeing a sign, a vision, while he's up in heaven being told to write about the things that he's seeing. He sees a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Does that sound familiar? What's the only difference there? Instead of what? Instead of 11 stars, it's 12. Well, that makes sense because in, in Joseph's dream, he has the 11 stars bowing down to him. He has the 11 sheaves bowing down to him, and he tells his dad, you know, the, are we going to all bow down to you? Well, now Joseph is part of the Jewish nation. And what it's talking about is the, the father of the Jewish nation giving birth to the 12 sons. This, this vision is the Jewish people, all of them, including Joseph. And verse 2, then being with child, this woman, the Jewish nation clothed with this father, the, the patriarchs that gave birth to the 12 sons of Israel who are typified by the 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Give birth to what? What did, what did the Jewish nation give birth to? Well, gave birth to Jesus, as we're going to see. It's talking about Jesus. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great and fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. Who's that? That's the devil. The devil who is against the plan of God, which the plan of God was to send Jesus into the world to deliver man from their sins. That was, he's against that. And we could get into the crowns and seven heads and ten horns, but we don't have time, but it's talking about the devil and his, and his attempts through history to raise up leaders to snuff out the Jewish people. And another sign, uh, or in verse 4, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth, and this is talking about the, the third of the angels fell with Satan to accomplish his goals on earth. And the dragon, the devil Satan, stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, when, when did that happen? You know, we just had Christmas 2019. What, ha what do we remember about Christmas 2019? The wise men from the east that are, hey, king of the Jews has been born. And they go to, they go to uh, Herod and they say, hey, Herod, where, where is he? We, we know there's a we know there's a Messiah that's been born, the king of the Jews. And, and Herod sends him, oh, the scriptures say, Bethlehem, go there and come back and tell me exactly where he is. And when they didn't come back to tell Herod exactly where Jesus was, he sends his troops and says, wipe out every single child two years and under in the city of Bethlehem. That was Dem Herod, and we don't really have to stretch too far to realize he was possessed of Satan. And, and his whole life, he was a possessed man. He killed his own family. He killed his own wives. He killed his own children. He was obsessed with being in power. Even when he's an old man dying of a disease that he's screaming in pain. This is Josephus. He's absolutely screaming in pain of his disease. And he's already locked up one of his sons that he's thinking, he knows, he knows he's going to die. And he's locked up a son that he thinks is going to try and topple his, his kingship. He's gonna, his son is going to do a coup d'etat. So he locks him up in jail. And then he screams out so loudly one time in his agonizing pain, didn't have, you know, didn't have pain pills or whatever. Um, and, and he hears his son tell the guard, okay, let me out so I can start ruling. And then he, and he goes, oh, really? You're going you're gonna to be excited, that excited about me dying? And have the guard kill his son. And he's just getting ready to die. I mean, he's possessed of Satan. And the Bible here is, uh, you know, is, it came to devour the child as soon as it was born. So she, verse 5, uh, and by the way, that's Matthew chapter 2 that I was just talking about. She, Israel, bore a male child who was to rule the nations with a rod of iron. Clearly, who is that? Now, now there's no debate. <laughs> who is the one that's supposed to rule the nations? It's Jesus. It is Israel giving birth to Jesus. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. When did that happen? Well, Jesus was born. He lived for 33 years. He was crucified. He was died. He resurrected. He ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father, which is where he is to this day. So then there's a 2,000-year gap between that verse and the next verse. And 
And this next verse ties with Matthew 24, 15, which we'll get to in a minute. So now there's a 2,000-year gap because now it's talking about the Jewish people having to go into the wilderness to flee from this same demonic influence on the world to try and wipe them out. Verse 6, then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her their 1,260 days, the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. So now the prophecy is saying, and this is future to us. And by the way, this whole prophecy of Revelation here requires the Jews to be in the land of Israel. The prophecies of Matthew chapter 24 we're about to read require the Jews to be in the land of Israel. There are multiple Christians, you know, professing Christians, I would say, <laughs> in some cases, that think that there's, the Jews should not be in the land of Israel today. That there is no prophetic significance for them being there. That they don't have the keys of Genesis 37 along with Re Revelation 12 to realize what they're teaching is false doctrine. It's, it's complete rejection of the plan of God. The Jews are going to be back in the land of Israel. So, uh, so there's going to be a time where the Israel is going to have to run into the wilderness to be protected by God miraculously for three and a half years. Verse 13, now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, because verses 7 through 12 of Revelation 12 is Satan being cast out of heaven that we talked about a, a week ago. Um, now, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman, Israel, who gave birth to the male child. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. We're going to see how that persecution is attempted. Because what, and I know I'm covering a lot that I, I fear I might lose some of you because you're not aware of the prophetic scripture of Revelation, but, but there's going to be a time where the world is going to have a ten-nation world empire, there's going to be an Antichrist that comes to be the head of that world empire. According to the Bible, he's going to be looking so good and such a friend of Israel that at first the Jews are going to think he's their Messiah. And for three and a half years, he's going to look that way. He's going to let them rebuild their temple. They're going to start sacrifices like they did in the days of Moses again. He's going to keep them safe. The Antichrist is going to allow the Jews to live in safety. And then what he's going to do is he's going to, instead of allowing everybody to just, hey, worship however you want, you have to agree with everybody's religion. You can't say your religion's the best. It's going to be a global religion of the Antichrist. But then he's going to shift because Satan is going to come inside of him. He's going to become possessed. And Satan wants to be worshipped instead of God. And so inside of this man, the Antichrist, he's going to turn against the Jews. He's going to go into the temple of the Jews. And he's going to declare to the world that now, forget whoever you've been worshiping, you're now going to worship me. And if you don't worship me, you're all going to be beheaded. You're going to have your accounts, your financial accounts secured. You're not going to be able to buy or sell. And you're going to have to bow down and worship me. And, if you, and as soon as you do that, I'll write my name into your right hand or on your forehead if you don't have a right hand. Everybody's got a forehead. <laughs> and so... So uh, write my name into your, and then your mind. I'm going to put, Satan's going to say, I'm going to put my name in you. God talks about putting his name in those people that love him. I'm going to require for you to keep your life. You're going to have to put your name in me. And Jesus warned his Jewish people that this event would occur halfway into the tribulation period. And he does it in Matthew 24, verse 15, where he says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which is, uh, spoken by Daniel the prophet. Daniel chapter 9 talked about this too in Daniel 12. And he's got, the abomination is him going into the temple declaring himself to be God, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Standing in the holy place, whoever reads, you know, this is Jesus saying, I want you to read it. I want you to understand it. Into the future, yet future to us. Then let those who are in Judea. Now where is Judea? Israel. He's talking, to his Jewish, he's talking to his Jewish brothers. He's not talking to us. He's not talking to the church because the church won't be on earth. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And what Revelation 12, 6 says, the woman fled into the wilderness. 
The wilderness is the mountain area east of Jerusalem. That's where the mountains are, and, and over in Jordan and Petra is where they think the Jews are going to run to. And it's going to be urgent. You have to do it immediately. Let him who is in the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant, to those who are nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Jesus, now, the church doesn't worry about the Sabbath, traveling on the Sabbath, but the Jews do. The revived Jewish nation worshiping God at the temple and doing sacrifices and going back to Moses is going to be strict on the Sabbath. And what Jesus is saying, you better hope it's not the Sabbath, because you'll be saying, well, I can't run on the Sabbath. <laughs> I can't. He's saying, you can't even wait a day. You, you stay in Jerusalem. When that Antichrist gets possessed by Satan, goes into the temple and declares himself to be God, and that you have to worship him, which is to worship the devil, if you, if, when you hear that on your radio or your iPod or whatever else you're seeing, if you, as soon as you hear that, you have to go right now and get out of Jerusalem, get out of Judea. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh, there'd be nobody left on earth. No flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. And again, how, how could Jesus' words even make any sense unless the Jews are in the land of Israel in the last days? And miraculously, they came back and, be, and formed a nation in one day. In one day, Israel was formed, May 14th, 1948, just like Isaiah 66 prophesied would occur. So all these prophecies that have been fulfilled, uh, the pro actual prophecies of the regathering of the nation of Israel into the land to renew their language of Hebrew, which was prophesied, to form in one day, as was prophesied, to have the fact that the nations are going to be against it, prophesied, all that happening, and, and, then, and that sets the stage to be able to fill these other pro prophecies and there's people that say, oh, no, the Jews aren't, aren't back in the land by anything prophetic or the will of God. They should be kicked out and let the Arab Palestinians have it. And they say they're Christians to do that. I just, it just blows my mind. It's complete rejection of the word of God. Revelation 12, 14, to finish our thought here. So Jesus says, you better run. You better get into the wilderness. The people, the Jewish people who listen to the prophecies of Jesus which will be proclaimed in the tribulation period after the church is gone, there will still be the word of God. There will still be people hearing about what Jesus taught. And the, but the woman, not the church, talk, the woman is Israel, was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place. That's them fleeing instantly, quickly, where she is nourished for a time, times and a half time, three and a half years. The last three and a half years. In the, so everything is very clear in Scripture. Three and a half years. First three and a half, the Antichrist is a good guy. Last three and a half years, he's after the Jews. You know, three and a half, Daniel, the same thing, has one seven-year period of time cut into two. So the serpent, Satan, spewed out water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. People think an actual, literal, somehow miraculous flood of Satan's divine, not divine, but Satan's powers being unleashed, or a flood of troops. He's going to send somebody to flood to take care of him. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, maybe swallowed up a whole army coming after him, swallowed up a literal flood that somehow was happening. We don't know. Is Satan capable of creating natural disasters? Can he do that? Yeah. Read the book of Job. <laughs> the book of Job he was able to cause war to happen. He was able to cause a great wind to come and knock, off, knock out Job's house. Uh, he, Satan can create storms. He can create things uh, when allowed by God to do so, and he's going to be allowed, but God is going to thwart his plan. And the dragon, Satan, was enraged with the woman who got away. The Jews that get away, he gets enraged. <laughs> and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, the rest of the Jews who didn't listen to Jesus. And who keep the commandment of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. He's, the, the Antichrist is then going to go on a rampage to kill all those who fear God, Jew and Gentile. And Daniel says he's actually given power over them to kill them, which is 
Uh, one of the biggest arguments against a post-tribulation rapture is that there, according to the Bible, there's nobody to rapture at the end of the tribulation. The, the, the people that come to Jesus in the last three and a half years of the tribulation, they get killed. Anybody that professes to have faith in Jesus Christ gets beheaded and killed. So let's go back to Genesis 37.10. Uh, by the way, so Jesus is warning these future Jews, you know, hey, you rejected me, you missed the rapture, you're doing your Jewish thing there in Jerusalem, following the law of Moses, doing the temple again, believing this guy is your Messiah. Well, let me tell you, he fooled you, he deceived you, and I'm telling you, when you see him turn, and he, he does something that no Jew would do, or a friend of the Jew would do, declare himself to be God, you get out of town, and I'll protect you. And so that there are some Jews, when Jesus returns, and they look, and they look on him whom they have pierced, and they weep in the wail, as it says in Zechariah. Now, does Jesus say before that, does he say anything typical to us? Yes, he, he say, the world is passing away in the lust thereof. He that does the will of God abides forever. You know, you know, turn away from the world. Believe and trust in Jesus. Isn't it tragic that there's going to be Jews in the future, after the rebuilt temple, being deceived by the Antichrist, and people are going to say, Jesus, the prophet Jesus, the Jewish prophet Jesus told us this. Look at all this stuff that's happening just like he said. Book of Revelation, book of Daniel, book of Zechariah, all this stuff. And we should run. No, I'm not going to believe him in it. Won't you? It, wouldn't those people agonize over the people that reject? Because they have all this reason to believe and to flee into the wilderness but they're going to stay behind. I'll take my shot with arguing with the Antichrist and saying, you know, you don't have to be mean to me. I'll still support you. Whatever. I mean, it's just they reject. And today, Jesus warns people to trust in him while there's still time or they'll be plunged into the tribulation period. The church of brotherly love, Revelation chapter 3, because you have not denied my name, because you have held on to my word, I will keep you from the hour that is to tempt the entire world. We just trust God. We hold on to his word. We don't compromise the gospel. He has promised me that there is a time to try this entire world, the tribulation period. And he is going to promise to save me from that time because I have not denied his name. I want all of you to join me if you have any. You weren't raising your hands then. I hope you all raise them because otherwise you're going to be like a foolish Jew in the day of the abomination of desolation who says, no, I'm not going to run into the wilderness even though Jesus told me to do it. Yeah. The church of Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love, which is in Revelation chapter 3, that prom God promised that church, a last day's church, that because you held on to my name, you'll be able to survive. You, you'll be able to be taken away from this time of trouble. So, then his brothers, uh, well, let's read verse 10, 11, and then end at 12. So, he told it to his father and his brother, and his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I, your brothers, indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Then his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And we really should stop there, even though it's a little earlier to keep the context, because we'd have to stop in the middle of a section of Scripture now. And, and let me conjecture. Again, I don't know. I like to conjecture, though, at times, as you know. Shechem is several miles north. You know, that's where they were, right? So they're, they're le they have a massive flock. Jacob had a, a massive flock. It got supplemented with whatever Isaac, his father, had that he inherited. So he's got a massive flock. And when you have flocks, you've got to keep your sheep and goats moving because they chew the grass down, and you've got to keep them going someplace else. So, so they're going to Shechem. They're going past all these Canaanite cities that are around that Jacob was so afraid of, you know, them wanting to kill him. But, you know, the fear has been put into these Canaanites to not attack the Jewish uh, people, these brothers. And so then they're, they're out there moving north to Shechem. Now, why might they be going to Shechem? What happened in Shechem? Yeah. Their dad buried a bunch of gold and silver idols underneath the terebinth tree. Eh, you know, it doesn't say, but they go up to Shechem. And, uh, you know, maybe they dug them up because we know they're corrupt. 
I mean, it, it really, the, you read the Old Testament, and you sit there and you go, the Jewish people, man, why did God choose them? Even the fiddler on the roof, he sits there, why, why did you choose us? Go choose somebody else. And, and God says, I didn't choose you because you are so squared away. Because they are stiff-necked people. We're going we're gonna to see after they try to kill Joseph and everything else that we see Judah go off and uh, marry a Canaanite woman, have some children, you know, go into a, a, what he thinks is a harlot, ends up, he doesn't know, it's actually his, his uh, daughter-in-law, and he's off years playing around in the world. And you see these sons that want to kill Joseph, they see him lying to their dad, they see all this stuff going on. So they went up to Shechem, and then they go up to Dotham, probably to trade their wares and stuff with the traders coming over from the east, because it's on the road that people would come to trade down in Egypt, and they sell their brother into slavery. So um, we're going to cover that next week, and uh, but stop here. But for us, it's okay that Jesus says we got to bow to him to have everlasting life, right? We're not bothered by that. We don't feel like we have to hold on to our own life, have to do things our way, not let Jesus rule our life. We can do things God's way. We can be obedient to him. We can be a you know, a father's boy. Is it okay to be a father's boy? Absolutely. <laughs> because he's God the Father. He's a perfect father. He created us. He knows us. Everything he tells us to do is for our own good. And let the world think what it wants to do. You know, Joseph had to say, I don't care what you think. It's my dream. And I can keep it if I want to. <laughs> uh, it's going to be the truth. He could have known it was going to be the truth. It's a dream. It's a warning. It's a truth. Let the world do what it wants to do. They're living a lie. They're believing a lie. They're following the devil. They're deceived by the devil. They're worshiping the devil in some cases. Possessed of the devil in some cases. You know, increasingly, Dr. Shrinks are starting to admit that it's not a mental disease. There has to be demonic activity involved because of what they're seeing exploding into our culture. You see articles that they're beginning to believe this is not explained. This isn't because he was born in a room that was too cold. It wasn't because his mommy didn't burp him right. It was, this was really because they're possessed. There's an evil here. And if there's an evil, there's also a God. And there is a war. It's a war for the souls of man. And while all we have to do for the soul of man to move from condemnation, rejection by God, is to go from pride to humility and say, God, forgive me a sinner. And I hope everybody's done that here today. And if not, it's a good time to start. Father, we thank you. And I pray if there is anyone here, Lord, that has never really bowed the knee and submitted to you that they just join in this prayer, that all of the rest of us, Lord, can, can remember the day that we did, the day that we did go from pridefulness and rejection to humility and confession of you, that, God, I, I come to you humbly, Lord. I've lived a portion of my life in serving myself. And in serving self, I'm really serving the devil who has deceived humankind away from you. To be self-centered, to be rejecting of your law, rejecting of your son Jesus. And, and while I was still yet a sinner, you even then were in your mercy allowing me to live so I could come to this day to say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for rejecting you. Forgive me for my fight against you. In foolishness and in ignorance, I did so. And today I'm coming humbly to say I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want to turn away from my sin. I want the help of your promised Holy Spirit to change my heart from wickedness and self-centeredness to a heart of humility and obedience to you and love for others and love for you. And God, I come today knowing that apart from this, apart from your mercy and grace upon me, I would deservedly be sent into hell. But I don't want to join the devil and his angels and those that serve him in hell. I want to join you, the God of mercy and kindness and love, to be with you forever and ever in your place called heaven.
to bask forever and ever in the light and worship you along with the angels for the great things you've done to save me. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Holy God of all creation, you bring light to all who seek your face, yeah. So we lift our hands, our hearts and sweet. your name in all the earth.